Hi everyone. So uh, today we're going to be talking about muscle tone, the first class in the clinical neurology series. And in this, I'll be touching about the basic physiology, uh, how to examine tone, and the important abnormalities of muscle tone. So first, coming to what is muscle tone. So muscle tone is basically tension in the relaxed muscle, or better defined as resistance of the muscle to passive stretch or passive movement in the absence of any voluntary movement of the muscle. And naturally the tone, the resting tone is going to be more in the anti-gravity muscles because it is these group of muscles that help us maintain the erect posture. And because the resting tone is more in the anti-gravity muscles, when we have disorders of hypertonia, that is spasticity, uh, this spasticity tends to involve or is more greatly appreciated in the anti-gravity muscles compared to the other group of muscles. So what maintains the muscle tone? So we have the uh, spinal segment that is a gamma loop. So the gamma motor neurons which supply the intrafusal fibers and proprioceptive information from this is taken by the afferents to the spinal segment and this local loop at the spinal segment level maintains the muscle tone and this is known as a gamma loop. But this is not the only thing that maintains the tone. We also have descending or higher influences from the higher motor centers which modulate activity at the spinal segment. And this is when we have the this is why when we have loss of the descending influences. For example, in a pyramidal or a corticospinal tract process, there's going to be a hyperactive muscle tone or an increased muscle tone because of the loss of the inhibitory uh, influence of the uh, higher motor centers. Now coming to how do you examine the tone? Uh, so the important uh, thing to note before we go into this is there is no scale or any quantitative measure of tone. So muscle tone examination is totally based on clinical judgment and there can be significant inter-observer variability. And the two important prerequisites before examining the muscle tone is number one, the patient should be very much relaxed and number two, the patient should be cooperative for your exam. Because if these two things are not going to happen, you're going to have a falsely, uh, you're going to falsely appreciate an increase in tone. So it's very important. These are the two important prerequisites. And before we uh, actually go into the um, uh, examination of the tone, it's important to also palpate the muscle. But remember that a firm muscle is not equal to hypertonia. So it's not always a scenario where a firm muscle uh, on palpation is, equ is, uh, is equivalent to an increase in tone or a spasticity. So muscle, a firm muscle can be even present in normal individuals. So patients who are very athletic and who are very muscular, uh, or for them on muscular palpation, the muscle the muscles can feel pretty firm. And also in case of muscle edema, inflammation, muscle spasm, and even in pseudo hypertrophy and muscular dystrophies, the muscle can feel firm on palpation. And this does not mean that the patient is having any increase in tone. And as I mentioned earlier, tone is resistance of the relaxed muscle to passive stretch in the absence of any voluntary movement. And tone is better appreciated in the extremities compared to the trunk. So obviously we're going to examine the tone in the uh, in the extremities that is the limbs and first when you examine the tone you have to do it at a slow speed or in a slow velocity after which you have to take varying speeds of both slow as well as fast movements and before checking the complete range of movements first move the joint in the partial range of movement and after you have done doing that then you can go ahead and examine the tone at the complete range of movement. So now coming to the special test in the tonic uh, in the tone examination. So one is the Babinski tonus test. So what we do is we abduct the arms at the shoulder and then what we do is we passively flex the forearm at the elbow. So in case the patient is having a decreased tone that is hypotonia, we'll be able to easily flex the elbow at the forearm because of increased flexibility and it can be bent at a much more acute angle than normal. But however, if the patient is having hypertonia, uh, this uh, passive flexion of the forearm at the elbow is going to be less and it cannot be flexed beyond an obtuse angle. And the other named test in tone examination is the head dropping test. So what we do is we make the patient lie supine on the bed without a pillow, relaxed and the eyes closed. And we place one of our hands under the octopus and we briskly raise the head and allow it to drop freely. So normally the head is obviously going to rapidly drop or drop very abruptly. But if the patient is having rigidity that is an extra pyramidal involvement, it's going to be a delayed and a more slow gentle dropping. And this is because of flexor muscle neck, uh, rigidity or increased tone of the flexor muscles of the neck. Now the other name sign in the tone examination is the Wartenberg pendulum test. So for this what we do is we keep the patient seated at the edge of the table and we keep the legs dangling free. And then what we do is we extend both the legs to a horizontal level and then suddenly release the legs. So normally obviously the leg is going to suddenly fall down and it's going to have around 6 to 7 oscillations. But if the patient is having extra pyramidal involvement, there is a rigidity, there's going to be a decrease in the swing time. There's going to be decrease in the swing time. 
and if the patient is having spasticity that is pyramidal involvement the swing time is going to be normal but this movement this pendular movement is going to be jerky irregular and the forward part of the movement is going to be more appreciated and it's going to be a zigzag type of movement so this is the wartenberg pendulum test and the other name test in tone examination is the shoulder shaking test so again we make the patient seated and we place our hands on the patient's shoulders and we shake the patient's shoulders briskly back and forth and we observe for the reciprocal movements of the arms so in rigidity there's going to be a decreased range of the arm swing whereas in hypotonia these reciprocal arm movements when we briskly shake the shoulders is going to be much greater and there's going to be a greater excursion of the arms and next is the arm dropping test uh, this is somewhat similar to the wartenberg's uh, pendulum test so here what we do is the arms are briskly raised to the shoulder level and then you suddenly drop it so in case we're going to have the patient is going to have spasticity there's going to be a delay in this downward movement so when, this is because of the spasticity is a velocity dependent phenomenon spasticity is a velocity dependent phenomenon so what it means is uh, when we rapidly move the joint the spasticity is going to be more better appreciated so when we suddenly drop the when we suddenly drop the arms after abducting it there is going to be a delay or a hang up and this brief hang up or catch when the arm is falling down is known as the bechterous sign and in hypotonia obviously this dropping is going to be more abrupt than normal now coming to the abnormalities of tone so the important abnormalities of tone are going to be hypotonia that is decrease in tone and then we're going to have hypertonia that is increase in tone and increase in tone can either be rigidity or it could be a spasticity rigidity is an extrapyramidal involvement and spasticity is a corticospinal tract or a pyramidal involvement and then the other tone abnormalities are paratonia and then we have myotonia okay so these are the tone abnormalities that we'll be touching upon uh, touching upon in this class so first coming to hypertonia so hypertonia can either be peripheral or it can be central okay but remember that it is usually peripheral and hypertonia signifies a lower motor neuron disease involvement and as i mentioned it is the gamma loop that is the gamma motor neuron supplying the intrafusal fibers and the proprioceptive information from the intrafusal fibers is taken by the sensory fibers back to the corresponding spinal segment so any involvement of this can cause a decrease in tone so this can be either the motor unit involvement which could either be an anterior horn cell involvement or a motor nerve involvement or it could be the proprioceptive pathways that is a sensory nerve involvement and remember that not only peripheral causes but even central causes can cause hypotonia so these are cerebellar lesions so classically cerebellar lesions is an important cause of central hypotonia so how do you differentiate between the hypotonia in a motor unit involvement compared to that of a cerebellar involvement so in the motor unit related hypotonia there's going to be obviously weakness but however in cerebellar lesions there's not going to be any weakness there's only going to be hypotonia and other causes of hypotonia are going to be chorea parietal lobe lesions cataplexy does not cause a sustained hypotonia it causes a brief or a transient hypotonia and yes cerebral and spinal shock so yes even though a pyramidal involvement does actually cause spasticity but in the acute scenario so when you have an acute cerebral lesion like in a stroke or you have an acute spinal cord lesion like in a transverse myelitis initially you're going to have a period of hypotonia so this is known as cerebral or spinal shock and however this is not a long lasting eventually it's going to be replaced by spasticity so the two important central causes of hypotonia that you should not forget the most important one is cerebellar lesion and the second one is going to be cerebral or spinal shock most of the other causes are going to be peripheral that is motor unit involvement or proprioceptive pathway involvement so regarding the increase in tone so as i mentioned it could either be rigidity or it could be spasticity so let's first uh, talk about rigidity so rigidity is because of extra pyramidal involvement that is involvement of the basal ganglia and its connections so the important two important points about rigidity is number one is it involves all the muscle groups equally that is there is a diffuse increase in tone both the agonist and antagonist muscles are involved this is one important point and the second one because of this there's going to be rigidity is going to be equally appreciated throughout the range of movement and it does not vary with speed so these these are the three important 
points about rigidity that's going to help you differentiate it from spasticity. So when it takes spasticity, it does not involve all the muscle groups equally. It tends to involve a certain group of muscles. And it's not equally present throughout the range of movement. And spasticity is velocity dependent. But on the contrary, rigidity is diffuse. It's present throughout the range of movement. And it absolutely does not vary with speed that it is velocity independent. So even if you move the joint fast or slow, you're going to appreciate the same degree of rigidity. And there are two types of rigidity. One is lead pipe rigidity and one is cogwheel rigidity. So we'll come to that right now. And before that, we have to know what is known as stone activated rigidity. So sometimes you might have a patient where you strongly clinically suspect there might be an extra, extra pyramidal involvement, but there isn't much of rigidity you're able to clinically appreciate. So in this scenario, you have to do what is known as tone activated rigidity. So what we do is, uh, let's say you're trying to appreciate rigidity in the right hand. So you make the patient do a voluntary activity in the left hand. For example, you can ask the patient to tap his thigh with the left hand, or you can ask him to draw circles with the left hand. So when the patient does a voluntary activity on the unaffected or normal side, the it will unmask the rigidity which is present on the involved side. So this is known as tone activated rigidity and you should always perform this in case of suspected extra pyramidal involvement where you're not getting overt rigidity. And coming to the two types of rigidity, one is lead pipe and one is cogwheel. So lead pipe is basically the rigid, diffuse rigidity which is present both in the agonist and antagonist muscle throughout the range of movement. Whereas cogwheel rigidity is actually tremors that is superimposed on the underlying rigidity. So basically the patient is having rigidity, but on top of that, the patient is going to have tremors. So it feels that the patient is having, uh, the movement is broken up into a series of steps. So I've just put a small video graph. So you can see here, I'm examining the tone of the patient's uh, left wrist. And you can note that there's rigidity both in wrist flexion and extension. And on top of that, you can see that there is these small step-like movements or disintegration of the movements. So this is what is known as a cogwheeling because it feels like as if you're moving the cogwheel. So these are the two important uh, types of rigidity. One is lead pipe rigidity and cogwheel rigidity. Both signify extra pyramidal involvement. And cogwheeling though we usually check it in the wrist, but actually it is starts in the proximal musculature and then only spreads distally. Even though clinically we usually check it in the distal musculature and rigidity and cog, uh, that cogwheeling is well appreciated in the neck, the truncal musculature and the flexor musculature of the extremities. And rigidity always goes along with the other neurological signs associated with extra pyramidal involvement that is hypokinesia or bradykinesia as well as tremors. And tremors could be the form of resting tremors or uh, it can even be a re-emergent postural tremor also. But remember that usually it's associated with the other extra pyramidal signs. Now coming to the other important type of hypotonia that is spasticity. So spasticity is because of pyramidal involvement or corticospinal tract involvement. So on the contrary to rigidity, number one, the spasticity is not uniformly appreciated throughout the range of movement. This is opposite compared to rigidity where it is uniform throughout the range of movement. Number two, a very, very important one is spasticity is going to vary with the speed of movement. So what it is mean, what it means is it is velocity dependent. So what does this velocity dependent mean is in well examining the tone, if you suddenly increase the velocity of your movements while checking that particular joint, there's going to be a sudden increase in tone. So spasticity will be brought out by rapid movements while examining the joint. So this is the basis behind the pronator catch as well as the spastic kick. So we'll come to videographs of the same. So this is the patient with ALS who I'm examining for pronator catch. So what you can see that I'm supinating and pronating the joint first initially little slowly and then suddenly I give a rapid supination. So in case the patient is having spasticity, the patient is going to, you're going to have a sudden catch when you do the supination. This is known as a pronator catch and this is because of sudden spasticity of the pronator muscles. Similarly, in the lower limbs, what we have is a spastic kick. So you can see I'm examining the tone of the lower limb. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to suddenly fling the knee joint up. And you can note that the foot is lifted off the bed. This is because I'm giving a sudden increase in velocity. And this increase in velocity brings out the underlying spasticity. And the foot is lifted off the bed. So normally the foot will not be lifted off the bed in a patient who's having a normal tone or hypotonia. But in spasticity, when you suddenly lift up the uh, knee like this, you will be able to appreciate the sudden kicking movement or lifting movement of the feet above the bed. And this is known as the spastic kick and spasticity in the upper limbs is better appreciated in the flexor and the pronator muscles and in the lower limbs it is better appreciated in the extensor muscles so remember that we have uh, many scales for uh, assessing spasticity 
but an important one is the Ashworth scale. And coming to myotonia. So myotonia is another important abnormality of tone. So this is temporary involuntary tonic perseveration of muscle contraction with slow relaxation. So basically what it means is there's going to be a involuntary sustained tonic contraction of the muscle followed by a delayed relaxation. And remember that myotonia as you keep on doing the voluntary movement myotonia will actually decrease and this is known as the warming up phenomenon. But however if you have myotonia which worsens which worsens with persistent activity you would call that paramyotonia. So that is called as paramyotonia. So usually so basically myotonia is a involuntary tonic persistent contraction of the muscle followed by a delayed relaxation but however if you keep on doing some sort of persistent voluntary activity myotonia will eventually improve or it will decrease this is known as a warming up phenomenon but if the patient is having worsening of the myotonia with persistent voluntary activity that is known as paradoxical myotonia or paramyotonia and there are two important types of myotonia that we should be able to appreciate clinically one is percussion myotonia and one is grip myotonia so percussion myotonia what we do is basically we tap the muscle with our knee hammer or any other instrument and we can note that there is a myotonia or contraction of the muscle with delayed relaxation whereas in grip myotonia what we do is we ask the patient to grip our fingers or some other object and you ask them to release the object so you will note that they will actually not be able to release it very freely because of the delayed relaxation because of myotonia so let's have a look at videographs of both so this is me examining a patient with myotonic dystrophy type 1 and you can note when I tap over the thinner remnants uh -huh. there is a sustained contraction with delayed relaxation when I ask him to grip you can see that he is not able to release it easily okay so let's have a look at once more this is percussion myotonia uh -huh. and this is grip myotonia so grip they won't be able to let go of very easily because of delayed relaxation yeah and coming to the final uh, abnormality of tone that is paratonia so this is basically because of a diffuse frontal lobe disease and it is defined as an alteration in the muscle tone to passive motion so basically the tone will alter based on how you are passively moving the joint so it could be inhibitory or it can be facilitatory so inhibitory paratonia is also known as gegenhalten so basically the tone is proportional to the intensity of the movement so in case you are going to give a lot of intensity while checking the tone the patient's tone is going to increase but if you are going, going to give a decreased intensity of movement while moving the joint there is going to be a decrease in tone so basically the tone the uh, increase or decrease in tone will depend on how much intensity of movement you are giving while examining the tone whereas facilitatory uh, paratonia that is mid gehen is when the patient is over cooperative so the patient will allow you to move the joint very easily and uh, so these are the two important uh, types of paratonia and this is about the examination of muscle tone and uh, soon we'll be having more videos about the remaining of the neurological examination in the clinical neurology series thanks for watching please do subscribe